Chris Sewell here, baseball card collector, investor, dealer in that order. Welcome everyone, story time today, although this one's a little bit different as it's uh, not my personal story. A viewer reached out, uh, said he, he really enjoyed my my sports card life journey video and he had uh, you know, a story of his own that he really wanted to share. So we uh, emailed back and forth a bit and, and decided it would make a, a nice video. Uh, his name is Jason and, and I, I really appreciate uh, him sharing the story. It's got a lot of ups and downs, some big hits and some, and some big misses. Uh, Jason's a high roller. We're going to call him our resident high roller. And uh, he kept a lot of the financials and a lot of the pictures of some of his large large deals. So we'll be able to include those throughout the, the video. But we'll start at the beginning when uh, he began collecting as a kid in 1987. Very similar to me. And, and uh, the card that drew him into the hobby was the 1987 Topps Mark McGuire. Thought he kind of looked like the jolly green giant standing at the plate and uh, dropping bombs. 49 home runs for McGuire in his rookie year. Jason lived near Oakland, so he got to go watch McGuire a few times as a kid. He thought the 87 Topps card was going to make him rich one day. You know, it's basically worth a few dollars today, just like it was 34 years ago. So uh, that didn't exactly pan out, but it did draw Jason and many others into the hobby, so played a, a, an important role in, in that aspect. He collected for a few years as a kid, and then, like many, sort of lost interest as he gets into junior high and high school as, uh, you know, sports and girls and social circles take over, and cards just sort of drops off, off the radar. It was uh, 2003 when they reappeared on Jason's radar. He's now in his mid to late 20s. LeBron James was the biggest hyped rookie in any sport, maybe ever. Uh, and like many, he wanted to pick up some LeBron rookie cards. He started going to the local card shop at the mall and, and picking up 2003 uh, basketball wax boxes and you know buying Topps packs at the 7-Eleven. Topps packs were three dollars each, and you know a full box might run you one to two hundred dollars or so. He landed some killer LeBron James cards, although this was of course you know decades before the insane. Uh, price jumps we've seen recently. Two of note that he got include this 2003 Bowman Chrome X Fractor. He sent it to Beckett and it graded an 8.5. He sold the card in 2006 for $750, a really nice sale at the time, although of course that card is well into the five figures multiple times over today. Another one of note is this 2003 Upper Deck Rookie Exclusives Autograph, a really tough uh, on-card auto. He held on to that one and, and still owns it to this very day. A BGS 9.5 recently sold for, for 20 grand. In 2006, Jason had a daughter, and, and in 2010, he started a business that invested in uh, the stock market and, and real estate. So from maybe 2006 to 2014 or so, cards were sort of on the back burner, uh, and, and the card market was pretty pretty flat in that time period. Uh, around 2014, you know, his business had, had been doing quite well by now, so he had some expendable income, and he uh, decided to, to get back into cards a bit. He bought a case of 2014 Topps Chrome Football for $350, roughly $30 a box and, and just thought this was you know dirt cheap and had the feeling that prices across the board were undervalued So he started uh, buying here and there in 2015 He purchased a Jerry Rice rookie PSA 9 on eBay for $400 This would lead to a deal which sort of catapulted him into a, into being a bigger player in the hobby The seller contacted him and asked him if he wanted any more rice rookies as they lived fairly close to each other And he had 20 more rice PSA 9 rookies uh, and he was offering them for $350 each cash Jason agreed to buy all of them. That's $7,000, way more than he'd ever spent on cards before. Uh, they meet at a bank and, and the transaction goes smooth. The seller then offered him a PSA 10 Jerry Rice rookie for $9,000. He agreed, paid, and headed home with $16,000 worth of Jerry Rice rookies. You know, a bit freaked out as again, he had just never spent this much money on cards before or anywhere where near it. Uh, but the concern quickly faded as he started selling the Rices for, for a nice profit. The seller called him a few more times. He, he, was, a, he was an old school guy. He, he liked dealing in cash way, way more than eBay. And uh, Jason ended up buying a few more items from him, including two Joe Montana rookies, PSA 10, a John Elway PSA 10. And he also got a Kareem Abdul-Jabbar rookie, PSA 5, as a throw-in. He sold through everything in 2016. Here is a breakdown of how he did on those cards. You can see he spent $38,000 overall on those 25 cards, sold everything for $62,000 plus, profiting over $24K, a return on investment of about 64%. Now, now it's funny because these sort of numbers would usually be considered a fantastic result. 64% return on your money when you're dealing with high-end singles. I mean, I'll certainly take that any day. But of course, the 2020 price boom, it can be painful to consider hindsight. Uh, Jason went ahead and made the chart for your viewing pleasure. Here, here's the approximate current values of the cards today. You can see there is maybe $360,000 left on the table or so, which, uh, which you know can hurt to think about. Jason has asked me to save him a seat on that time machine I'm still waiting on. I, I certainly will save him the seat. Uh, I expect it any day now. 
Well, it's easy to say there was a missed opportunity here. The truth is pocketing $24,000 off of just a few cards really acted as seed money and really encouraged and pushed Jason to go strong into the hobby and investing in cards. He started identifying cards that he thought were undervalued, most notably in football, as that was where his uh, main expertise was. You know, heavy on quarterbacks, a lot of low serial number to rookie cards. He just thought you know cards were very undervalued, so a lot a lot of room for growth. So he just started buying uh, and holding. When when the 2020 price boom hit, you know he started selling off some of these these cards. As by now, you know the returns were just through the roof. Wait until you see the prices he paid for some of these cards just a few years ago, and their current values. In 2019, he paid $3,000 for this 2017 Patrick Mahomes Red Power Prism, which is numbered to 49. It's a PSA 10. Tough to say what it would sell for now, perhaps $50,000 to $100,000. He has another one which he bought raw, for, uh, paid $200 for in 2018. It's currently at Beckett being graded. Same set, but the Camo Prism, these are out of 25. BGS 9.5, he paid $400 in 2018. It's probably worth 100 times that today. Picked up two Mahomes silver prisms in a case break in two, uh, 2017. He had the Chiefs in the break and was actually gunning for Kareem Hunt, ironically. Got three Kareem Hunts, but also two Mahomes, which uh, he sent to PSA and got a, a, a 10 and a 9. These two are probably worth about $20,000 now. The case break cost him $80, and it cost another $20 to have them graded. The Hunts are worth uh, just a few dollars. He bought this Michael Thomas 101 Black Finite Prism PSA 10 in 2018, paid $235 for it. No idea what this would go for, uh, perhaps 10 grand, let's say, and it would probably be the record sale for a Michael Thomas card in history. Bought a couple of Tom Brady's in 2016, paid $2,500 for the pair here. Current market value is around 65,000. Bought three gold X-Fractor Roethlisberger rookies in 2016 for $345 all in, sold them for 6,800. Uh, 20 x his money on those. Some more examples of big money returns over the last few years. Three Aaron Rodgers 2005 Topps Chrome Rookies. Bought all these as PSA 10s. Five Russell Wilson 2012 Topps Chrome Rookies. Again, bought all of these as PSA 10s. 25x return on his money on the Russell Wilsons. He plays the grading game, of course, as most high-end investors and, and dealers do. Uh, these are cards he bought raw and, and had them graded and sold. Josh Allen, Drew Locke, Deshaun Watson... You can see he had a heavy focus on quarterbacks. Overall, since 2016, Jason spent all the original money he had off the Rice Montana Elway deal and spent an additional 165K. So starting at that point, he has spent about $227,000 on cards over the last four to five years. He did not sell a single card until 2020 and then finally started selling off last year. He has done 122,000 in sales so far in the last year or so, meaning that he's still in the hole for $105,000, but here is what he has to show for that. Current inventory, everything you see in these pictures is he is still holding today. You can see a Jordan rookie, PSA 9, some Tom Brady rookies, uh, two Chromes and an SP, the LeBron Auto we mentioned earlier, some high-end Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh cards. The value of the eight cards in this picture alone is approaching half a million dollars. But that's not all. A lot of high-end Patrick Mahomes, Luka Doncic, Deshaun Watson, and others. You can see a heavy focus on uh, rookie cards. Mike Trout, so you can see the uh, Topps rookie PSA 10 in the upper left. A Montana and a Rice rookie, both PSA 9s. Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees, Russell Wilson, all sorts of high-end stuff. And uh, there's quite a bit more. Heavy on football, but some baseball, basketball, some soccer, and, and some Pokemon. Older Topps Chrome unopened cases, a variety of unopened wax, a lot of football, basketball, and, and soccer. It's tough to say what the overall value of everything is, probably over a million dollars. Some of it Depends on some of the stuff at PSA and Beckett at the moment, but uh, he does uh, intend to sell the vast majority of it in 2021. Certainly, he's going to keep some cards for his personal collection and, and continue to reinvest. But he said, once it's all sold, we can you know do a follow-up video, maybe maybe look closer at the financials, see how it all all turned out. Uh, might be fun. Uh, Jason offered two pieces of advice for me to share with everyone, and I think they're really good pieces of advice uh, for investors. So I'm just going to read them directly. Th th these are his words. In a perfect world, I would have held on to all those cards in 2016 and just used other money to continue to buy up more cards. But you cannot predict the future or perfectly time any investment. The most successful investors take their profits and continue to reinvest. As long as you practice this method and make smart choices, you will continue to grow your wealth over time. This is spot on. I mean, it's easy to say now, oh, you should have just held those Montanas and those Rices and the Elway for five more years and sold them now. But this is not realistic to have timed or predicted that, and, and his money would have been tied up for a really long time. Perhaps if he had done that, 
he wouldn't have had uh, some of these buying opportunities he's had since. Um, and he has one more piece of advice, which again, I'll read directly his words. I collect a variety of cards, but my main focus is on football. The reason is that I know the game, the league, and the players extremely well, which I cannot say the same for the other sports. I hear a lot of people who have a tough time investing in football. I can tell you that if you're a quick flipper, just uh, stick to basketball. Football cards are longer holds, maybe months or even years to pay out correctly. If you have the money to hold and you have good knowledge of the NFL, then there are some great deals you can take advantage of. I know many influencers have told you that it's all about basketball, and I completely disagree. Collectors should focus on, on players and, and not a particular sport when investing. Find talented players that are overlooked and undervalued. Look for players in the year five to seven of their career and who look like they have a shot at the Hall of Fame. The first couple of years of a player's career will have the highest cost hype. And again, at the end of their career, once everyone knows that they're an established as a Hall of Famer. In year six or so, nobody cares at that point unless you're a GOAT. Plenty of great players in this range that are great buys in all the sports. As an example, I'm a Chargers fan and there's not a fan out there that wants Justin Herbert to be the next big thing more than me. He has all the skills to make this happen, but the problem is he's on the Chargers. I know this organization as well as anyone, and they are one of the worst franchises in pro sports from ownership down to the hot dog guy. Justin will put up big stats and his cards will carry some value for a year or two, but when he does not consistently win, his cards will plummet in value. You have to win championships in the NFL to hold value, and the Chargers have never won, and they play in the same division as Kansas City. The AFC in general is just stacked. I, I hope I'm wrong about this, but if I'm correct, you should buy Justin Her Herbert cards in year five or, or six of his career after they've uh, you know fallen in value and, and nobody's looking at him. This will also apply to Joe Burrow on the Bengals. He, he looks like a stud as well, but he's on the Bengals. They, they are right there with the Chargers, so I uh, think you know where I'm going with this. So that's it, uh, our resident high rollers journey through the card world. Thank you, Jason, for sharing your story and uh, for, for the great advice at the end. I, I totally agree on, on both points. Hope everyone enjoyed. Please let me, let me know what you thought in the comments. Uh, considering making this sort of thing a regular feature on the channel, uh, it sort of depends on if people enjoy it. So uh, all feedback is appreciated. Have a great uh, day and see you on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday for high and regular rollers. Thanks, guys.